Tonight on Brian Ross Investigates. He was the first target of the special counsel's investigation, pleading guilty to lying to the FBI about his contacts with suspected Russian operatives. Tonight, George Papadopoulos and his new wife, Simona, tell their story, love and loathing in the age of Trump, as he tries to build a case for a presidential pardon. Plus, Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist, caught in his own lies and fabrications under oath. And I, you know, I myself have, you know, almost had like a form of psychosis back in the past where I basically thought everything was staged. You know, I've now learned a lot of times things aren't staged. But are his rants protected by the First Amendment? And our shout out for the reporters in Dallas who investigated what the police dashboard camera could not see. Don't move! On your stomach! On your stomach! Leading to the exoneration of these two men. It feels really good. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. Tonight, the man who was target number one for the special counsel's Russia investigation, George Papadopoulos, convicted of lying to the FBI about his alleged contacts with Russian operatives. It was his claim that he had been told the Russians had Hillary Clinton's emails that really started the whole Russia investigation. His new book, Deep State Target, How I Got Caught in the Crosshairs of the Plot to Bring Down President Trump. George and his wife, Simona, now join us live from Los Angeles with their version of events and their story of love and loathing in the age of Trump. Mr. and Mrs. Padopoulos, Apelos, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, Brian. You know, we've known each other for several years now, beginning well before you were arrested and agreed to plead guilty to lying to the FBI. And executive producer Rhonda Schwartz and I were the only guests at your wedding in Chicago last year. You would always be special to us. Uh, literally the only two persons to attend our wedding. With all best wishes, I congratulate you. I wish you good luck and all the blessings your hearts may hold. There's the wedding. And I kiss your bride. So you've just had your first year anniversary, a year in which you went to prison for 12 days, wrote a book, moved to California, talked about running for office, and something else. You've changed your story now, George. You say in your book you did not lie to the FBI, even though you said so in court and the judge reduced your sentence after he said you had shown remorse for what you did. So what is the story? Tell us. So it's a very complicated story, and that's actually why I had to write this very lengthy book that took me six months to actually produce, um, because there's been such misunderstanding and misrepresentation of who George Papadopoulos as an individual is and his actual real involvement in this, uh, I guess, uh, probe that uh, consumed uh, the world for the last two and a half years, uh, which has recently um, completed with uh, the firm conclusion that there was actually no conspiracy or no collusion between uh, Trump, his associates, and the Russian government. And quite frankly, um, I predicted that all along because, as I explained in my book, uh, I actually was never really targeted for my Russia ties, but for my ties to uh, Israel and uh, what uh, all the various characters in my entire saga uh, turned out to be, something I did not know when I did plead guilty uh, almost two years ago now, was in fact that these were not Russian operatives who were engaging with me, but in fact uh, Western intelligence operatives and uh, possibly working at, under the guidance of the FBI itself when they were... Um, you know, meeting with me, discussing various uh, information regarding Russia, um, emails, and uh, various other campaign activities um, that I was involved in or might not have been involved in. So um, that's really what the story is in a very superficial uh, uh, lens and uh, angle, but I'm more than happy to get into more details about it. And uh, Simona, my wife, uh, she actually became involved directly in uh, the probe, and she could probably share her thoughts as well. But, George, are you regretting now that you pleaded guilty to lying? Look, uh, I have new counsel for a reason. Um, I've been very vocal that I believe my old counsel, uh, and I included in my book, uh, were actually possibly compromised uh, during the time where they advised me to plead guilty, um, especially regarding the obstruction charge, which... Uh, Later, Bob Mueller himself dropped. So uh, my new counsel has uh, basically advised me that there are grounds for not only withdrawing uh, from the guilty plea, and that's something that we were actually 
openly discussing all over the media months before I even reported to my 11 nights in prison. But uh, we're actively, I should say they are actively, as they are my counsel, I'm not a lawyer, they are currently looking at to, into those options, uh, potentially uh, suing the government on my behalf or uh, seeking a pardon itself if uh, all other recourse uh, doesn't materialize. Well, George, this is your theory. I know that the whole thing was a, a deep state attack on you and Simona and Donald Trump. Are you just saying this now because you're trying to get a pardon from President Trump? You know, a pardon actually it practically doesn't affect my life one way or another right now um, because I've already served my time and I'm living happily in Los Angeles with my wife and uh, we're involved in many interesting projects that have nothing to do with, um, you know, real politics at this moment. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the last thing I would have ever thought I would be doing in my life is writing a book about the so-called deep states and uh, what has now been quite evident and revealed, uh, including uh, my congressional testimony that has now been uh, publicly released, that in fact uh, I was set up and uh, it was made to, uh, to seem like I was in fact uh, up to no good working with Russians or Russian intermediaries, but uh, that's just not what happened. And my testimony to Congress uh, uh, reveals that, uh, public pronouncements by uh, Congressman Mark Meadows uh, John Radcliffe, and even the president himself well, discussing uh, declassifying particular FISA material regarding my case um, is uh, basically portrayed today as uh, information that could possibly even support the sitting administration, not hurt it. So um, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I'm not uh, spouting uh, conspiracy theories. Everything that's laid out in my book is uh, based in fact and well, George, just, do you uh, George, let me ask you, story. have you heard from the White House? Are you going to get a pardon? Um, as I stated, uh, my lawyers are currently involved in this matter exclusively. I'm not involved uh, directly or indirectly. They believe uh, that pursuing a pardon would be in my legal interest. Um, and uh, if they are in discussions with uh, White House counsel or the White House itself, uh, they're keeping me out of it, and it's probably best to do it that way. George, we've got a question for you and Simona from the control room from your friend, executive producer, Rhonda Schwartz. Hello, George Hi, and Simona. Rhonda. Hi, Rhonda. Glad to, have, glad to have you with us on the show tonight. You know, we, we've, we were amongst the first reporters, I think, to learn that you were under investigation. There was a famous photo that showed you meeting with President Trump and with um, Attorney General Sessions. And uh, as we understand it, you, were t you told us that at that meeting you talked about possibly getting a meeting with Russia and that they agreed. Later, Sessions said that didn't happen. What do you say about that? Is that still what happened at that meeting? Um, I've been very public about uh, this meeting, and uh, the information I'm going to provide here is the same information I provided to Bob Mueller and the FBI itself. Uh, my recollection differs tremendously from Jeff Sessions regarding that event. Uh, it's my uh, recollection that Jeff Sessions was, in, was very enthusiastic about the prospects of uh, Donald Trump uh, not only going on a foreign policy trip, but possibly meeting Vladimir Putin himself. I was so confident uh, in my, uh, you know, my statements and the reaction from it that I hand-delivered Jeff Sessions my business card after I made that comment to him. And I then uh, met with Stephen Miller, who at the time was an obscure uh, aide to Jeff uh, Sessions, but now he's obviously a senior official at the White House. And Stephen Miller and I continued to coordinate for the subsequent two months regarding setting up a potential meeting with uh, Trump and Putin. George. So the notion that uh, Jeff Sessions pushed back against me, and then I continued to uh, attempt to set up this meeting with senior level campaign members is absurd. One final I, I question. I remember my first uh, bet. Yeah. Simona, one final question. Okay, no, does your like husband my... deserve a pardon? Yes, sorry. Uh, I think he does. And uh, I was uh, very vocal about that. I, I was the one out there asking uh, to President Trump uh, to pardon George. I remember my very first interview with uh, uh, George Stephanopoulos and uh, that uh, Rhonda kindly uh, introduced me to, uh, for, to ABC News. I mentioned George as John Dean, and uh, I always uh, highlighted this patriotic duty to cooperate uh, um, uh, the, with the uh, Spencer Council. And uh, that's, that's also—sorry, do you hear me? Yeah. 
I, I hear something, yes. So I always highlighted this uh, key role uh, that revealed to be very different from the one that uh, has been perceived in the beginning when I mentioned this uh, comparison to Jordan Dean. Uh, but still, uh, I think his life uh, has been paused uh, for too long. Uh, I've been living with him, this uh, purgatory, and uh, we are very happy today because our rehabilitation process open to new opportunities we are fully enjoying. Uh, we are very happy in our life. If uh, uh, our bond is very solid, as you said, it's a, a love story in the middle of uh, something that is probably one of the hugest <laughs> investigations uh, in the last century, and you had the opportunity to know it because you have, you've been there for day number one, and you are the only two people who attended our wedding, so you will always be special to us. But as I said, George doesn't have any expectation in terms of pardon. I do. I do because it's uh, uh, fair and he has been treated unfairly. Uh, I think misremembering a date, uh, uh, it's not a crime. Uh, uh, we don't know yet who is Joseph Mifsud, that at least uh, after two years of investigation, uh, the FBI didn't uh, figure out who is, George Mif uh, who is Joseph Mifsud, sorry, not George. Not right. <laughs> and uh, I uh, been involved directly, I uh, testified uh, to the Congress and re recently to the Senate. And I gave my own, I shared my own experience personal knowledge of uh, this individual who I had uh, the unfortunate uh, occasion to work with uh, uh, yeah. at the London Centre of International Law Practice. Well, Simona, I met him even... Simona and George Papadopoulos, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate it. Up next, another man. Yeah, up next, another man who talks of plots and conspiracies. Alex Jones, under oath. Does he deserve to be protected by the First Amendment? After years of broadcasting his ugly and false conspiracy theories, Alex Jones is now facing a reckoning forced to testify under oath in a lawsuit brought by several parents whose children were killed in the Newtown school shooting, a shooting that Jones at one point claimed was staged, never happened, even alleging that some of the children who were killed that awful day are actually still alive. We're joined now by Rachel Strom, a leading First Amendment lawyer here in New York, to help us understand whether Jones can win his lawsuit, claiming he's protected by the First Amendment. And Rachel, let me show you first a couple of excerpts of his testimony, questioned by lawyer Mark Bankston. And I, you know, I myself, you know, almost had like a form of psychosis back in the past, where I basically thought everything was staged. You know, I've now learned a lot of times things aren't staged. So, um, you know, I think as, as a pundit and someone giving opinion um, that, you know, my opinions have been wrong, but they were never wrong consciously to hurt people. So he says it was his opinion. He's a pundit. He suffered from psychosis. Is there a First Amendment defense for this man? Well, I, I don't want to opine on if he is going to ultimately be found responsible or not in this lawsuit. Um, there is a First Amendment defense for opinions that's long been held in our, in our Constitution, that the, the First Amendment protects ideas and opinions, and we think the best way of resolving disputes over opinions is to air them and have people um, say they're countervailing ideas. On the other hand, statements of facts can be, uh, you can be responsible for statements of facts if those facts are wrong and defamatory. Um, and I think the claim here is that that the uh, parents are arguing that some of his statements went beyond just opinions and actual statements of fact that were defamatory to these parents and their children. He's actually invoked uh, the important uh, Supreme Court ruling, Times Sullivan, which allows mm -hmm. all sorts of statements to be said about something of great public interest or a public figure. Is that a defense for him? And isn't it the fact that, you know, you test the First Amendment by some of the worst cases, and he certainly, no one really, not, I, many people don't care for what he has to say, but mm -hmm. is he protected? Should he be able to say these things, ugly as they are? Again, not to sound such like a lawyer, right. I'm not going to tell you if I <laughs> oh, think he's are. protected in this case right. or not. No, I certainly am, and, and, uh, and a little cliche one at that. But um, the, the New York Times versus Sullivan case you talked about is this case from 1964, which says that public officials, and later expanded to public figures, can't bring a defamation claim unless that they can prove that the person who said something about them said something not only false, not only defamatory, but with something called actual malice. And the idea there that is they subjectively believed what they were saying was false, or they 
entertained subjectively doubts about what they were saying and went ahead and, and said it anyways. And I'm quite confident that the defense attorneys here that are representing Alex Jones will be using that, that case law to say that wrong as he was, he earnestly believed it, that he was in some psychosis and, and believed it. That, that being said, the actual malice standard is an extraordinarily high standard, and it is an important standard that we rely on all the time. But it is surmountable. It is something that people can overcome if, if um, the plaintiff is able to show that Mr. Jones showed willful blindness. He chose not to find out what the truth was and went ahead and started saying false statements anyways. Should journalists support him now? Since he wants to be covered by the First Amendment and all reporters' privileges? Well, again, I'm a lawyer, not a journalist, yes. and, I, and I'm very proud to know the difference. And I <laughs> think that, that it makes a good First Amendment lawyer to not try to be a journalist. And I think that there's a real debate here about uh, when someone goes too far and what is real news versus fake news. And, and I think there is a, a debate between journalists, and you probably can answer that better than me. But it is important to defend the First Amendment, even with somebody who has says things that a lot of people don't agree with. No doubt. No doubt. I mean, that the First Amendment is meant to protect us all, not only your belief, the real test is can you stand up for someone's speech that you don't believe in, for sure. Well, Rachel Strom, thank you very much for joining us tonight and for your insights. A very important question. Thank you Coming so up, our shout-out for the reporters in Dallas looking for answers about what the dashboard cameras could not see. Our shout-out tonight to an investigative reporting team at the Dallas Morning News that has spent months of the last six months looking into one family's claim of police brutality. It was the family's word against that of the police. No one was killed, and it's the kind of incident that might easily get lost in the press of other news, but not for these reporters. Um, one location of your emergency. It was on a late afternoon last August when police in the Dallas suburb of DeSoto responded to a report of a heated family argument. As the police dash camera shows, everything was calm when the first officer pulled in. That was about to change as the Dallas Morning News reporters discovered. Hey, get on the ground. Get on the ground, man. Relax. Just get on the ground. You come over here. The cops came okay. in overheated. Okay. They they brandished their weapons, hey. were pointing their weapons at everybody, started screaming at them to get down on the hot You're pavement. Come on. The video shows Sammy Anderson, the mother of four brothers, who had initially asked for police to be called, trying to restrain one of her sons. As more officers arrive on the scene and tensions continue to escalate. Don't move! On your stomach! On your stomach! On your stomach! Okay. On your stomach! Before long, police would use their tasers against at least one of her sons, leading to a claim of police brutality. Dallas Morning News investigative reporter Miles Moffat and engagement reporter Elvia Lemon heard about the incident from a local civil rights group and began to review the police videos. I mean, you could see a lot of, uh, you know, aggressive actions on their part and the family being very confused, asking questions themselves, not immediately responding to their orders to get on the ground, as you can imagine, because they didn't understand why, you know, the, the, their actions were so aggressive. No one's under arrest. We're just detaining everybody. Uh, and also, again, pointing tasers at their face, and uh, it's going out of control. So the dash cam had, had presented a, a fairly confusing uh, sequence of events. The family later told the reporters they felt they had been brutalized and had only called the police because they trusted the officers to calm the situation, not make it worse. This family told us that they had so much trust and their uh, police department, you know, they're from a suburb, so um, most of the time, you know, they see the police all the time. The reporters could not clearly make out what exactly happened, given the wide-angle view from the patrol car dash cam. But they also knew the Soto police were supposed to wear body cameras. So, you know, it became really imperative to get the body cam so we could have close-up detail. It took months before police released the body cam video. So we get the body cam, and the body cam, you know, is, is murky. One video is black. The officer wasn't wearing it. 
and during the tasing, um, at least four uh, cameras were, were not activated, and we, we don't know why. Leaving lots of questions about just how many times in this scene, Grant Bible, one of the sons, was subjected to tasing. That night, he suffered a hemorrhage to his eye, and his mom says she, she believes, or she saw an officer activate his taser close to his head. So the question is, did his eye injury uh, come as a result of the tasing? Um, and what else was happening? What else was happening in that, that closely knit uh, crowding? But with what body cam footage they could obtain, the Dallas Morning News photo editor, Marsha Allard, had videographer Brad Elledge put together a compelling, synced-up version of what happened. You okay, man? Would, you, would you like to tell us what's going on? It was actually Marsha's idea. She said, I think we need a Steven Soderbergh-like effect here. And, and what she was saying is the multiple perspectives so viewers themselves can draw their own conclusion. The timeline clearly showing how the situation so quickly escalated at the hands of the officers. The police chief says his officers acted properly. But one result of the Dallas Morning News reporting was that the district attorney dropped all charges against two of the brothers who were arrested that night, although it took months for that to happen. Some of the brothers lost their jobs because they were in jail when this happened. As for the DeSoto Police Department... We're, we're still waiting for some kind of uh, response from them, and uh, so far we're, we're just not hearing back. But thanks to the reporting efforts, the two brothers at least have now been cleared of charges that should never have been brought in the first place. Yeah, it feels really good. Um, we were able to go to the courthouse um, and just kind of see them uh, release some balloons the day they mm -hmm. that the two brothers um, the picture we took <laughs> yeah were exonerated um, and you know they it just feels like a weight off their shoulders no doubt a great feeling so our shout out tonight to the team at the Dallas Morning News for showing how investigative journalism can make such a difference sometimes it means people who break the law end up in jail but it's even better when journalists help people wrongly accused and help them get out of jail. I've seen that again many times in our reporting. So once again, hats off, a shout out to the Dallas Morning News for some great work. That's our program tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again right back here next week.